welcome to the Global Resolve Mission Mediation. It's a talk show where we invite influencers and thought leaders from across the globe and who share their perspective and their thoughts with regards to the subject of mediation. And today, gracing the occasion, we have Mr. A.J. Jawad, advocate, mediator, and a trainer who's a veteran in this space. Uh, welcome, Mr. Jawad. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. And thank you, Gayatri, for organizing this and for inviting me. Great. So, so let's let's get started with your initial thoughts on the very concept of mediation, how you have seen it evolving, and what is the future you see in mediation? <clears throat> well, the concept of mediation, I look at it as a, as a sort of an, uh, an empowering process. Uh, because historically, you look at the history of mankind, Whenever we have had conflicts or disputes, it's always some third party who sits in judgment and tells us who's right and who's wrong. So from that conceptual framework, there's a huge paradigm shift where the third party no longer tells you whether you're right or wrong, but tells you that, look, it's your problem. And I think it's best that you discuss it and find a solution that's, that suits you as well as suits the other, uh, the other party to the dispute. So in that sense, there is a complete uh, uh, change. You know, there is a whole paradigm shift in the conceptual framework of dispute resolution itself, and therefore I view it as a, a very empowering process where parties are, um, uh, you know, encouraged uh, to take responsibility to uh, to solve their own problems, to take their own decisions and to come to solutions that would be uh, not defined within any framework, such as uh, a legal framework, uh, but that which uh, suits their interests. Uh, of course, it operates within the framework of law. So uh, in the sense that you know, mediation, as they say, works under the shadow of the law. It cannot be an agreement which would be uh, you know, uh, against public policy or sure. Uh, something that totally militates against uh, common sense or against uh, uh, a, a sort of a moral code that society binds itself by. Uh, subject to those exceptions, I think parties can, people who are in dispute can reach any agreement that they want. Got that. Fair enough. So essentially what I hear is two very important aspects. One is attacking the conditioning of mind. I think what people have got used to it. So let a third party, you know, I mean, we'll be happy to give our reins or like in the part to a third party to decide exactly. right who's wrong, where we are the beneficiaries, we are the people in like, you know, we are getting victimized. Exactly. Why not we get into power? So that's great. Yeah. And second thing is what I hear is the creativity which creeps in through mediation, where, you know, a bit of give and take and like, you know, looking at anything within yeah. the form yeah. of law. Yeah. Mm. And how, how do you see mediation convention in Singapore as well as a mediation bill in India? You know, so more noise, more voices about this particular concept. Is it help the cause? I mean, is it helping? Because a lot of people had this apprehension about enforcement and, you know, those kind of things. So would it help? See, let me put it this way, Sanjeev. Uh, the question of enforcing a mediated settlement agreement is uh, actually antithetical to the very concept of mediation. Uh, because if it is somebody else's decision, yeah. then it needs enforcement. When it's your own decision, where is the need for an enforcement? Okay. Because it's ultimately you have decided that this is the best solution. And uh, what are you aggrieved against? And uh, why should you go back on your agreement? But it so happens, you know, that uh, we have been so conditioned to uh, follow the the, the British. Uh, legacy of you know, what the British have given us. I'm talking from the Indian context, not only the Indian context, because Britain virtually colonized, I think, three quarters of the world. Right. So from that perspective, the problem is we feel that even when people reach an agreement on their own accord, uh, there is a possibility that there might be a default. So people need that kind of an extra uh, security uh, that this agreement, even if one of them goes back on it, should be uh, enforceable in a court of law. So, or are they executable in a court of law? So, I think from that perspective, uh, the Singapore Convention, 
plays a very significant role because uh, in cross-border mediations. Because if uh, parties across the borders enter into a mediation and they have a mediated settlement agreement, which is uh, outside India, now how will India, uh, how will that agreement be enforced in India? See, the enforceability part of it is not just, uh, you know, uh, that, that may arise on account of a default, but also if both parties also want to execute the agreement here or enforce the agreement here, uh, there should be a legal framework for recognizing that agreement as a valid one and something that is enforceable uh, within the jurisdiction uh, of the, within the borders of India. So from that perspective, the Singapore Convention does uh, bring in that kind of uh, enforceability to the agreement. Uh, so that is as far as the Singapore Convention is concerned. Now, insofar as the mediation bill is concerned, once again, the problem is having inherited this legacy, uh, especially our legal community yeah. is uh, so trained to look at everything from the perspective of institutional recognition and institutional sanction. Right. Okay, so we have these institutions called the parliament, we have this institution called the courts, so unless and until something is ratified or sanctified by these institutions, we don't uh, give it the importance that it otherwise would deserve. So uh, that is where the catch comes. And that's where I think the act will perhaps you know, help people to understand uh, that it is a process uh, which has some gravitas, uh, which has a legal recognition, and uh, that is... Uh, uh, recognized and uh, you know sanctified by our institutions, uh, so the acceptability becomes easier for people uh, because they have they they can always uh, look at the statute if they have any doubts as to what the law says about this place. But otherwise, I don't think there is any law because you know uh, the whole concept of mediation is uh, designed to uh, go against the established paradigm of dispute resolution. As I said earlier, that some third party uh, rendering a judgment based upon uh, the law. So here there's much more flexibility, much more uh, you know, openness and transparency. And, uh, and ultimately, it's the decision of the parties and not the decision of anybody else. Uh, so I don't feel actually there's a law required, but then the law always helps people to find some comfort in the fact that, okay, this is a legally recognized place. And therefore, we should, you know, uh, we can try it, or we should try it. Uh, well said. So the point which probably we should pick up, or, or the comfort we should get from the mediation bill, is the term recognition of the concept, right? But less of the enforcement bit, I guess. Because as you rightly said, when the parties on their own, uh, you may God, where they get into a settlement, then ideally they should not be looking at any enforcement because they are the ones who chose that uh, decision. And in case one of them, like, you know, violates for a reason known unknown, then I think it should be taken as a simple failed mediation and we should live with it, right, in, in a way. So do you sometimes see a vision of such kind of a concept called mediation can actually stifle the creativity and the flexibility, which is the very basic premise of mediation? So I don't think it will uh, stifle the creativity as such because... Uh, Ultimately, when you reach an agreement, it has to be something that would be workable for both sides. Right? Uh, just because it, the law makes it an enforceable agreement doesn't take away the creativity part of it uh, or the autonomy part of it. So it is still an autonomous process. It's still a party-centric process. It's still driven by the parties. And it's still something that the parties have to agree to. And this is where the creativity part comes because... Uh, uh, we have tailor-made solutions when it comes to the law. We have binding judicial precedents. We have laws which define rights and uh, liabilities. Now, that part of it will, uh, will not be applicable to the mediation process, even if the act comes in. It will actually detract from the creativity part. I'm sure that, you know, the creativity will still be there because uh, as uh, William Murray and Rob uh, Fisher say, uh, generate multiple yeah. options. So, so when parties are going to be discussing different options as to how they would like to resolve the dispute, uh, that is where the, the you know the, the having thought showers, sitting together, discussing the pros and cons, uh, 
uh, you know, evaluating each uh, option for its own merits to see whether it is workable, you know, applying the right kind of tests to those options, to see whether these options would be workable or not. That's where the creativity will come. So the act will not have an impact on the creativity part. So these gotcha. things that emerge from the mediation. Sure. Okay. So court and mediation versus private mediation. Your thoughts? My, my feeling is that uh, these two things should be, uh, I may be wrong on this, but I, I sincerely believe that these two things should be kept separate. Because uh, in court and expediation, the, the purpose of court and expediation and the focus of court and expediation is to have a settlement so that uh, matters get resolved and do not have to go to trial and thus, you know, dispose of uh, cases and reducing the backlog of the cases through uh, recourse to the these kind of uh, procedures like mediation. So uh, that operates under, I feel, uh, th th there is an, uh, you know, um, I would not say there's an element of coerciveness there, uh, but nevertheless, what happens here is that uh, the focus is more on uh, reaching some settlement or the other. So the push from the perspective of whether parties have reached a settlement or not reached. But my feeling is mediation is something beyond that. Because uh, my experience in the court and its mediation process has been that uh, oftentimes parties don't reach a settlement at the mediation table. But what happens is, if you have done the process effectively, you have set them on a path uh, of a, a collaborative thinking of, uh, and a, more of a problem-solving approach to the uh, to the you know the whole issue. So what happens is they may not have been ready at that point of time, either from an emotional perspective or from a perspective of uh, uh, where the issue stands for them at that moment. Uh, but as time goes on, well, because you have put in them that thought process of thinking in terms of solving the problem instead of, you know, uh, and also uh, help them to understand what their underlying interests are, that puts them on that path where in the long run, uh, maybe perhaps after three months or four months after the mediation, we get to know that the matter has been set. And the lawyers call us and tell us that, okay, this has been, uh, you know, if you uh, look at mediation from that larger process, so formational uh, process where the thinking of the parties, you know, the perspectives and the way they think about the problem undergoes a transformation. So they stop, one, they stop identifying the other person as the problem. Number two, they are able to recognize what their real interests are. Okay, number three, they are, they are uh, instead of getting fixated on what they want, they start looking at it from what they need, what actually will help them. And they also have a, uh, the ability to look at it in a more objective manner. Rather than you know, because one, uh, whatever they feel about the whole thing gets vindicated through the mediation process, thanks to the you know the role that the mediator plays in listening to them and understanding their feelings and emotions of the whole issue. So in that sense, I think a private mediation may perhaps uh, stand on a different footing altogether, because that is a process where parties may voluntarily choose the process of mediation without being told to go. Now, here is where, again, you know, the, uh, when the law comes into force, there's going to be a sort of a mandatory mediation. So parties have to go for mediation. Now, there again, my feeling is that mandatory uh, mediation is good in a sense that many times people don't know that there is such a process available to them, that an option like this is available to them. So all you're doing is taking the horse to the water and telling them that, look, you it is your choice. Now you want to drink it or you don't want it. So if from, if viewed from that prism, I think mandatory mediation is in a sense good because it doesn't still detract from the, you know, the voluntariness or the uh, self-determination part of the parties. It, it still is a process where parties still have the, you know, the, the uh, option of walking out of this at any point of time. So, from that perspective, uh, this might be a little different. Okay. Okay. And as we say, it's mandatory 
key mitigation yes. as an attempt as an initiative taking the yes. horse to the water it does not mean any which way that you necessarily need to exactly. reach yes. a settlement right the other part of it uh, uh, see uh, what, what the other part of it is in port and expedition the whole process is controlled by the courts agreed right? so it is a fallout of an adversarial process where you are sent into this and you try to work it out you see whether you are able to resolve your issues and then you go and report to them. Uh, so in private mediation, it is something. It is uh, it is completely autonomous in the sense that uh, you can decide where you want to sit in the mediation. You can decide on what will be the mediator's fees. You can decide on the timings, and you know there is no uh, there won't be a sort of a, a compulsion that you have to resolve within a given time frame. So that flexibility will always be there in the private mediation process, and uh, it will not be that uh, you know you can you have to go to a particular mediator. You will have much more choice over there, and then based on the merit, based on the qualification, based on the ability of each mediator, the the market will decide as to uh, you know whom to go to and who will be uh, the chosen mediators for the particular case. There is the court and expediation, though you have a choice, but it is very limited. And all all these like you know put together create a conducive environment, right? Like a good yeah. environment where it might like you know, be very okay. So the last question. A mediator is expected to be more of a subject matter expert or a process expert. He may or may not be like you know, subject matter of expert, but does it come any which way in you know as a hurdle or something? Your words. Uh, see, my uh, my honest opinion is that I would give more importance to the process expertise yeah. than mediator because right. um, it yeah. is the process that actually moves the parties. To uh, in so far as the domain expertise, the subject expertise is concerned, yeah. perhaps some working knowledge for the mediator may help in understanding the, the core of the, you know, the, the dispute. Uh, but more than that, I don't think it helps in any way because ultimately it's the parties who are going to decide. And you have always have the option of getting the help of an expert to understand the subject. Okay, and to uh, decide on any objective uh, standards that need to be applied to this. So my my emphasis would be more on the process expertise rather than the subject expertise. Perfect. So I think uh, maybe uh, your last uh, thirty second, uh, you know, views on India versus world with regards to mediation. Where are we? What else we need to do? Right? And and is it a race? Which I mean, more important is the direction right? So. Your views on this. Okay, that's uh, uh, th th that's a question which can't be answered in 30, 30 I, seconds. I, I would agree, but probably some initial thoughts. We need to come back to you shortly, you know, yes. for a bigger round. See, table. yeah, uh, okay, uh, here the problem is, you know, um, culturally, though we say that mediation has been there in our ancient culture and all that. The problem is uh, almost two or three centuries of uh, colonization have left us yeah. uh, bereft of the ability to take responsibility and decide on our own. So we always have this urge, uh, or rather we have this inclination to accept something that comes from our country. And perhaps that's also, you know, our culture, our, uh, the, the, the high context culture that we operate in, uh, because we defer to authority, right? And we respect our parents. We we always, you know, to, uh, in Indian families, marriages are decided by parents. Whom you have to marry, when you have to marry, at what age you should marry, what you should study. So much so that when you can consummate your marriage also is decided by the family and the parents. So in a, in a, in a culture like this, to expect people to suddenly, you know, uh, grow up and take responsibility for resolving their own problems becomes a sort of a challenge. And that's Something that I have encountered very frequently because people realize that, yes, we have to take the responsibility, but there's some fear that is pulling them back. And that fear is something that has been ingrained in us because uh, thanks to the, the cultural paradigm that we operate in, where different authority is taught to us, unquestioning acceptance of uh, people in authority, uh, blind obedience, that is what is taught. Now, mediation is a process which uh, requires you to you know, take responsibility for your own actions and to decide on how you want your future to be. Uh, so this is where the challenge comes. 
But I see a lot of hope with the younger generation because that is where I see that, you know, there's a lot of independence and uh, they would like to take their own decisions. So uh, I think over a period of time, we will evolve as a society uh, where, uh, you know, it's uh, in, in one, when I was in uh, Kerala once for a training program, one of the judges said uh, that mediation marks the cultural maturity of a nation. So if you, if you really... Uh, accept mediation as a dispute resolution process. You're culturally mature because it means that you're willing to take that responsibility, right? So that is where I feel that, you know, it is going to happen over a period of time. And uh, mediation is an idea that uh, right. whose time so, has come. You borrow the words of... Essentially, the direction yeah. is right. It's just the pace, I guess, yes. right? Yes. Great. So I think that was it from my side. And thanks for taking our time. I think this is going to be really encouraging because, you know, we... We put these videos on like you know on air and like you know, more and more stakeholders get to see. And so it really helps in our initiative of adding the awareness and the sensitization. So I thank you once again for taking our time. Thank you. And so we'll you. Definitely come back. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Gayatri. Thank you.